In the case of nuclear or radiological fallout, people living around potential targets such as military bases and chemical plants may be advised to evacuate. I always forget to uh, remove the, uh, the the submag card at the beginning. I got to take that down. Hi, welcome Sublation Media viewers and uh, readers. This is the Sublation Magazine show. Sublation Magazine is at sublationmag.com. Uh, it's our new uh, online journal. Um, and this week, Ashley Frawley and I are hosting the Sublation Magazine show to highlight some of the uh, articles that are in the magazine, uh, Derek Varn, longtime uh, friend of me of the show <laughs> of, <laughs> of the of the uh, channel, is here to talk about his uh, a recent essay in the magazine. But we'll be bringing him in in a minute. Before we uh, uh, do that, I want to talk about just one thing that's been in the news. I um, recently saw uh, Ryan Grimm on Breaking Points. He had written a piece for The Intercept called The Elephant in the Zoom. Meltdowns have brought progressive advocacy groups to a standstill at a critical moment in world history. Um, that was the full title of his essay. And uh, in it, he talks about how, I guess, call-out culture or cancel culture, uh, maybe struggle sessions, something else, have um, kind of torn apart uh the world of progressive politics, not just um, the left, not just Twitter, not just newspapers or magazines, but um, actual political advocacy groups such as Planned Parenthood or the ACLU have been kind of brought low by internal strife um, around call out and cancel culture. And he wrote a piece about this as a systemic problem, or at least a, a rampant one, um, on uh, in the progressive left or in progressive liberal uh, political sphere. And uh, I wanted to start out by reading a quote from his article. Here it is. It's uh, the dynamic, the toxic dynamic of whatever you want to call it, call out culture, cancel culture, whatever, is creating this really intense thing and no one is able to acknowledge it. No one's able to talk about it and no one's able to say how bad it is. And, um, Reading his article and watching his interview, um, it, it occurred to me that I had, might have been thinking about the issue of cancel culture in the wrong way up until this up until this point, because I saw it as a cultural problem on the left, maybe a symptom of our feeling of powerlessness, um, and uh, but not a, a deep uh, cultural problem just in a, in America or globally. But it seems to me now I'm worried that this might be symptomatic of something uh, deeper, like some sort of overall breakdown in civil norms. Uh, or and and uh, I, mean, I feel like I'm I sound like a conservative when I say that. I don't I don't uh, <laughs> mean to. But um, the the idea that we have a practical project together that we're working on collaboratively through our in, in places of employment, especially in the progressive left sphere, um, that that seemed, would seem to me to be something that we could hold on to, even if we try to police each other's uh, discourse during our leisure hours, you know, or even if we're trying to control what we see as entertainment on TV. But for this to influence real politics and real political um, advocacy, uh, so deeply, I mean, bringing these organizations to a standstill, according to Ryan Grimm, um, that's troubling in a new way. And and not not so much because I always agree with these advocacy groups or think that their approach to politics is adequate, but just that um, I worry that uh, we have a, 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 a cohort maybe of, of people who are uh, just not up to the task of, of uh, working together. Um, and, and cooperating together. But um, Ashley, I, I sent this your way and you had like a, a, a deeper reaction to it than my gloss. And I, I want to give it to you to, to, uh, to talk about what you thought of the article. 
Yeah, um, I had a completely, maybe not deeper, but a different, a different mm -hmm. kind of reaction to it. Um, so the article is kind of centered around um, a, an, some infighting that went on within an abortion advocacy group. Is that right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, uh, and so they talk about how there was this, you know, it opens with this Zoom call where they were like, we need to talk about George Floyd and what can we do as an organization? And then the um, talk kind of devolved, according to the author of the article, into kind of, well, the bosses or the management seems to think that there's a problem outside in the world and they seem to have a kind of a charitable or orientation toward it. Like, what can we do with the money that we have to make a difference in this? Whereas the people working in the organization were like, well, we have issues within the organization where, you know, management seems to think that because we have a, a calling and a, a belief in what we're doing that is beyond just going to work every day, they can kind of push us to do more out of goodwill. And they didn't like that. Um, and so it became this kind of discussion about, well, maybe we could have um, something, a little bit of laxity around deadlines. Maybe we could have um, not be penalized when we take time off <laughs> and things like this. And the manager was like, how dare you? You're so selfish. <laughs> and I just, I found that so interesting, that kind of opening discussion, because and initially, while I was reading it, I was thinking like, oh, yeah, you know, these NGO types can't think about anything beyond themselves. And then I and I think, Doug, was that kind of your reading of it? Yeah, I mean, uh, my um, initial thought was that you had a people in these organizations, I'm assuming younger people, I mean, I mean for me, almost everyone on the left is younger, but uh, that, that were frustrated by their personal circumstances and their inability to bring their ideas into fruition, and uh, by the way in which these organizations from the outset have been set up to only tackle one issue at a time. So they wanted to bring in, yeah. you know, other concerns, like for instance, in the in the case of the uh, the abortion rights advocacy advocacy group, which is a, a, apparently mostly a research group uh, providing data about abortion rights mm -hmm. in America. Uh, two of the larger uh, activist community, um, they were cons they thought that 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 mandate uh, that that project was too limited, and they wanted to bring in other uh, aspects of the struggle for reproductive rights, including mm -hmm. um, the particular concerns that uh, uh, Black women uh, have and, and the, the struggles that they face as they uh, try to obtain their uh, reproductive rights, um, and. My feeling was that they have this lens with, from, through which they view the world so that they have to always see uh, issues in, in relationship to their personal lives or th their personal struggles and the struggles uh, of others on a personal level, including their struggles within these organizations. And they don't have a way of framing the issue more broadly in a political way um, uh, to so everything becomes a matter of uh, their own in indignities and and feelings of helplessness and ways in which the organization can help them rather than uh ways in which they can alter the course of the the organization outwardly perhaps but i'm not yeah i'm not 100 percent sure that's what the problem is yeah i mean i think there are a few things going on here um so on the one hand you're right you know these kinds of single issue campaigns i mean uh, well, single issue organizations, this has become an enormous part of what we now consider the left is these organizations that organize around a particular thing. And that is really inhospitable to trying to expand to something that is quite different, right? Um, so the fragmentation of the left into all these different little campaigns, which occurred in the early 90s, um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and this kind of the death of you know, really existing socialism, it became like, oh, well, I'm for this and I'm for that and I'm for not having windmills and I'm for having windmills and all these sorts of things. Um, you, you know, we had this kind of myopic focus on particular things, which inhibits any ability to deal with larger issues, as you say. On the other hand, one thing that these organizations do um, allow for and encourage is something called mission creep. 
And so they will try to expand their mission because they're always at the, at the mercy of funding and they need to keep themselves relevant. Um, if the issue is not on the public agenda, they risk getting their funding cut and they can't exist anymore. And so they will have to kind of say, well, they'll piggyback onto issues that are currently in the news, but they will do that by applying a lens that they have ready to go, ready, um, already existing. So if they see the world through the lens of like, I don't know, gender or something like that, then they'll take this issue that's in the news and say, oh, actually this too, this too is a gender issue. And then if a movement becomes very successful, we start to see mission creep where everything becomes a gender issue or everything becomes a mental health issue and everything. <laughs> um, so we get this kind of mission creep, which is a totally different thing from building a mass movement. So the fact that the left has fragmented into these single issue groups and advocacy organizations, and NGOs and so on, um, is really inhospitable to mass movements for a number of reasons, but it is hospitable to a kind of mission creep that tends to view a wide variety of issues through a very small lens. Um, and then the other thing that's going on uh, um, is that I think in spite of everything that we've just said, <laughs> when mm. I read that line, um, I'm here to talk, so the manager was angry and she says, I'm here to talk about George Floyd and the other African-American men who have beaten up by society, who have been beaten up by society, she told her staff, not workplace problems. Mm. And that struck me as something really interesting because although the people in this organization are not workers, I can see this kind of divide and conquer going on where it's like, um, the, or this, uh, not divide and conquer, no, although that's part of it. It's this tendency to say, "You're how dare you be so selfish and greedy asking me for higher wages? Mm -hmm. Don't you know money can't buy happiness? You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> this kind of attempt, is, don't you see the bigger picture? We have a mission here, you know, that will deflect attention away from job demands. And that's something that I've seen a lot. Um, and I will always go back to my own research. Sorry, you know, when you're an expert in something, you see it through everything through that lens. <laughs> but there is this, I saw the same thing in like the happiness discourse where um, there was a CEO who boasted of being able to keep wages down, actually boasted about this um, on the basis of gross national happiness and Buddhist um, principles um, of like, of encouraging like this, this, idea that actually we're here for something greater and so they can pull out more from people um and so you can see that with um all sorts of ways that capitalists try to bring in these like diversity things and training and so on so they can they are able to deflect attention from all sorts of issues that might exist within the workplace and and it gives them also an ability to say look i know we've got some independent I, I don't actually sit on the hiring panels. The other workers do the other, you know, mm -hmm. and they're, they might be a little bit racist, but we are doing our very best. We brought in all of these management consultants and we brought in these diversity managers and da, 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 and we're trying our best to make those nasty, selfish workers be nice. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it's, it gives them this out where it's like, I, as an organization, I am the, as the face, the CEO of the organization, a good, kind person, the people below me though, Mm, I don't really know. Um, so th this is something that I, I really kind of felt in that line where it's like, I'm, I'm here to talk about something bigger and it is bigger, right? Mm -hmm. And how, how dare you think about something else except this really big issue. But then it becomes this deflection activity because mm -hmm. and with the like much smaller, less serious thing, but with the whole happiness discourse, it was the same because when they start saying, well, what are you trying to say? Money buys happiness? The workers are like, well, no, I, I guess not. <laughs> and so they're mm. kind of backed into a corner. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like the, it, it gives the kind of the, the CEOs an, an out, you know, a, 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 a way of saying that they're interested in bigger issues. Sorry, I was well, going to give one what, more. What, okay. Uh, okay. Good. Well, I'll, 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 inter yeah. go, so I'll interject here. <laughs> so um, one of the issue or difficulties with understanding this issue, especially within organizations um, like, uh, well, let's say let Netflix recently, as an example, was that there was a workers walkout at Netflix. It was around um, uh, uh, how certain workers were unhappy with the content on the mm -hmm. platform, um, specifically around uh, Dave Chappelle's comedy special. And, they wanted to have a say over what was on the platform. 
the degree to which there was a uniform opinion amongst the workers about mm -hmm. that special was unclear to me. Um, but the it, it's difficult. It didn't strike me as a strictly a workers uh, struggle or a struggle over yeah. the kinds of demands that workers would normally mm -hmm. make, which would be uh, demands around working conditions, wages, health care, uh, even even like defining their job um, uh, you know, or, and, you know, either performance evaluation or just what their job amounts to. Um, I guess maybe that last bit, it, it would include that because mm -hmm. they wanted to have some say over the, over the editorial decisions that were being made uh, at Netflix. And um, at that point, you start to see like this woke ideology enter back into the uh, equation because mm -hmm. their demands were to make the company more sensitive to the feelings of a particular group of people, the trans community, particularly in that case. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there are, are institutional conflicts around, you know, what the aims would be as to and, uh, different kinds of uh, standards for, for publication, say, that, that were at work in some parts of the working class people at, at Netflix and other, some part of the workers at Netflix and the, and the management and the people who had set it up. Um, and so when you start to have an ideological battle that calls itself a battle for workers' rights or mm -hmm. um, that enters into even a struggle for unionization, things become uh, unclear, certainly for outsiders trying to figure out what their position would be in relationship to the workers. So, um, and in the case of the reproductive rights, um, the manager, I think, had brought up the George Floyd murder and the aftermath of it uh, in order to try to help the workers through a difficult time emotionally. Like that was the original call, reason for the call, the reason mm -hmm. for the meeting. And it devolved into, the, from the management's perspective, into a, a bunch of demands when you know, which got to the point where this comment was made, you guys are so self-centered, this isn't really about you. Um, mm -hmm. Which I think was tactically a mistake and also probably, certainly in the context of a, a struggle for unionization or uh, to change workplace conditions, is completely out of line and, and not acceptable. But uh, it does get complicated because of this call-out culture. So, I mean, one thing I guess we could ask ourselves is, is this referral to call out culture is this reference to call out culture just a cover for what is actually a, a struggle between workers and management in these uh nonprofits, or is it uh an idea ideology that's infecting the progressive uh liberals and making it difficult for things to get done as ryan Grimm yeah seems to say i mean I, I yeah i would obviously lean i would obviously answer the latter i mean but you could be generous I wasn't saying that in this particular case, that's what's happening. But, you know, these uh, nonprofits, although they are not value producing, they're not the people that are not workers in the, in the sense of, you know, in a, in a Marxist sense, they're still superficially subject to some of the same pressures um, mm -hmm. because they're funded under surplus value. They need to keep costs down. They're, they're super, like, their share of the pie is always threatened with shrinking. Um, and so they have to be productive. They're subject to the same kinds of constraints and therefore the same kinds of pushbacks, at least superficially. And so you can see some, as I said, superficial <laughs> relationship to things that go on in other in other sectors as kind of pushback. So, I mean, in the case of Netflix, you could be generous and say that the workers there were fighting for control over the commodity, which would be a kind of maybe a traditional more traditional working class demand, a more radical one anyway, control of what you're actually producing. Um, in a less generous sense, it might be just the leaking out of an obsession with process out into the product. Mm -hmm. Like this, this content is hurting me. That's I'm part of the process of producing. It doesn't reflect my values. And, and um, it makes my working day difficult. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I don't know. Um, I, I'm, because it was so ludicrous and ridiculous, I would like to, I, I want to just kind of write it off. But at the same time, 
I don't know, maybe there is, a, I'm trying to be generous here, maybe there is a rational kernel within the mystical shell. <laughs> maybe there is something. Within yeah, I mean, if we were to imagine that these people were socialists who are trying to seize the means of production, in which in this case would be uh, an NGO, um, <laughs> then there are ideological conflicts about uh, what should be included in the, their political mission would definitely arise, right? Mm -hmm. Um so I guess you can't judge this without judging what their demands were, what the content were. You had another point you wanted to raise, though, so I, I don't want to keep you from that. What was what was the final? Oh point? no! Well, the other the other thing that I was going to say, the other anecdote was that I was going to give was just that um, I just remembered I was I went to a conference conference thing panel thing once and um there were all these people that were trying to like catch the attention of this big kind of um charity charitable organization slash think tank and there were all these like recently um graduated philosophy phds and they were like trying so hard to make their ideas applied and they were like what we really need is we need ethics training in organizations. That's the new thing. We're going to teach people ethics. Like, you know, we wouldn't, uh, you know, we wouldn't have so much pollution and destruction if, if we just understood ethical principles. And I was like, so rude. I couldn't contain myself. I was just <laughs> laughing. And I was like, oh yeah, they just like dumping toxic waste. They're like, oh, I had no idea this was bad. <laughs> is it bad ethically? <laughs> I'll think about it next time. And yeah. I, and I was like, you know, they have to make a profit and they have to survive. And if it that means dumping chemical waste, ethics be damned because you're not gonna you're not gonna live to see tomorrow as an organization. And they were like, Oh, profit's not the most important thing. This like billionaire who arrived on a private jet was telling me that profit's not the most important thing. It's about our vision, it's about our goals. So I think like this idea of like a bigger goal, we shouldn't look you know, I think that's a it's a, actually a major trend that's happening. Um, this disavowal of profit, this disavowal of the the dirtiness of money, and the idea that we have a bigger thing there, and it's it's a it's a trick, it's an ideological trick, and we should be careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I definitely agree, and I do wonder if maybe part of the reason behind the breakdown in norms is that these institutions are failing. I know that when I first encountered kind of irrational wokeness in the realm of uh, fiction writing. It was around the time when which, you know, uh, novel contracts were scarce. Mm -hmm. The number of people who could make a middle-class living as novelists was dwindling, had been dwindling for some time. And uh, the fights were about, were over things like who gets to be in charge of the writers association. Yeah. And, um, you know how to and who gets to have the prestige and who doesn't rather than who gets a contract where they can spend a year writing a book and mm -hmm. you know who and, and this is this is in that article as well where they were saying like well we can't really do anything about these bigger issues but i can't get a manager fired and it's like a, mm -hmm. a microcosm of of the whole cancel culture like i can't do anything about the preca precariousness of work um but i can try to knock you off your pedestal and maybe i can grab it you know so it's like mm -hmm. this it's it, it's interesting that cancel culture tends to be so powerful in places where there are very few jobs available and there are tons and tons of people who want in. And it tends to be these kinds of like middle class um, jobs that are big dwindling and they're just tons and tons of people with degrees. And they're like, how dare you have that position? I want it. You're not good enough. And they'll search. They'll look for something that you've ever said or done to get you out of that position. And so there, there's a lot of that backbiting going on that's part, uh, a product of the precarity of the petty bourgeoisie and professional class. You know, now that you've brought up precarity, I'm reminded of the fact that I was supposed to ask everyone to subscribe uh, to the channel at the beginning of the show. And I was supposed to tell people that you can give super chats. I think you can give super chats. And if you want to, so if you want to give us money for some reason, you are welcome to. We'll put your comments on the screen if you do that. We'll try to. And I was supposed to announce that we have a launch event in New York City um, on Sunday, the 26th. Uh, we'll be in New York on the 25th as well at the KGB Bar and then at Project Parlor. And I have a little like video clip to run. So I'm going to run it now before I bring Derek on. I'm just torturing him, making him wait. Hello. I want to let you know that Sublation Media's official launch date will be Sunday, June 26, 2022. 
We'll be holding an event for this launch at Project Parlor in Brooklyn, New York. We'll run from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. And Norman Finkelstein, Margaret Kimberly, Pascal Robert, Chris Catrone, Ben Burgess, Jason Miles, Alfie Bound, and a number, a number of other interesting leftist types, including myself, will be there to talk about the left in a time of state and self-censorship. It's a free event. Everyone is invited. And if you live in New York City, I hope to see you there. All right, Ashley, I'm going to remove you from the stream, but don't go anywhere. You'll be back. And I'm going to bring in Derek Varn. Derek, welcome back to the Sublation Media channel. Hello. And thank, thank you for writing for Sublation Magazine. You wrote um, Burned Out for 2024. Came out, oh, what, about a, about five days ago. Yep. Uh, and I wanted to talk to you about that. This is something, you know, the Sanders campaign, when you were doing Pop the Left with me, something we talked about quite a lot. Um, kind of surprising that people are talking about Sanders running again uh, yep. for for uh, president. But you wrote about why this is a failed idea and some of the reasons behind uh, the, the the desire for that. What are, What do you think the strongest arguments are for Sanders running again. The strongest uh, arguments are is there is a chance that a primary uh, challenger to Biden could actually win, given Biden's popularity is at Herbert Hoover levels. I mean, like, it's it's pretty bad. Um, the And it's, it's not even clear that Biden's going to run in 2024, although it seems like increasingly he might. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's that. There's the idea that that uh, Sanders is still the most individually popular politician that's that's nationally known in the United States, um, which is which is an interesting development. Um, but and I suppose you could also add that it's an alternative vision of what the Democratic Party could be compared to this neoliberal fiasco um but you have to put an asterisk on all of that because it's <laughs> it's a pipe dream <laughs> I, I i couldn't when i saw this article i was actually surprised because the i saw arguments defending it on twitter and the arguments defending it on twitter were actually better than the arguments made in the article which is not a great sign. Um, uh, so this is an article that came out, I guess, the beginning of last week by um, uh, Branko Marcetic, uh, who wrote uh, Yesterday's Man Against Joe Biden, um, which is a good book, actually. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, detailed book, which explains to you why Joe Biden sucks. And... He talks about how a lot of early Biden supporters actually want Trump back, um, even though Trump is still polling negatively as well. Um, and so, you know, uh, a run at 82 isn't such a big deal. Reagan did it, although Reagan wasn't 82. Um, and so we should try it. Uh, and then off the article i heard arguments about how the wave of starbucks and amazon uh unionization would would, would only increase even if bernie failed in 2024 mm -hmm. and uh a, a bunch of similar arguments to that and a lot of people attributing the whole starbucks amazon thing to the bernie sanders campaign um which is there any argument for that? I mean, is there any evidence at all to suggest that that is the case? It would be almost impossible to disprove. But what I will say is um, the Starbucks and Amazon and Apple Store unionization things are net positives. But the broader trend since COVID has been union decimation. Um, and the AFL-CIO released a growth plan this week that indicates that they don't really think um, 
that this is going to be a huge revitalization moment. It was they're like predicting like a half percent to one percent growth um, a year, which if you really look at it, given their prior year's growth, was more like sustained decline management um, in shifting sectors uh, to service and to um, and to the public sector unions. Um, to put both, that in context, that's a one percent growth rate. While the the number of workers is increasing at a a, a greater rate, yeah, is much that, greater rate, yeah. yeah. So, so and and we need the larger context for that is also like the traditionally highly unionized industries, uh, which would be in uh, what we would nominally call like blue collar manufacturing. Um, that's only about thirteen percent of the nine to thirteen percent of the of the working population, and again. We have to remember these stats are from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They don't define the stuff the way Marxists do. But um, so even at your most conservative a, a, a definition of what a worker is, which I think everyone agrees that blue collar industrial labor is productive, um, the the base for that is declining both in the fact that automation is still increasing. Um, it will never get to zero. I mean, Aaron Benyanev's pretty much proven that also like nobody who thinks about, um, you know, a Marxist economics should believe you could have a totally automated field. that would not be profitable pretty quickly, mm -hmm. but the, the, the trend there is not great. Um, also, Already existing unions do not really have a whole lot of growth within within their industries and fields. So if it's not closed shop right now, it's generally not growing unless it's new, which tells you a lot. Um, now, what does that have to do with, with Sanders? If Sanders had revitalized the workers movement mm -hmm. um, across the board, I don't think it would be so sectional where the growth is. Because what we're seeing is finally retail mostly around tech and high-end goods is getting some unionization um and it's it's unionization mostly around like traditional workers wise issues it's not like these media unions that we're seeing that uh start demanding like editorial control um mm -hmm. that are largely around ideological lines mm -hmm. um but the other there's a bunch of other problems with it too because the reality of who the voter base is for the DSA and what the DSA wants people to think the voter base is, is becoming more and more different. Mm -hmm. So every Pew poll that I've seen uh, that talks about progressives and socialists, and they, they, there's the Pew poll is weird because they define the socialists could show up on either the progressive category, or this other thing called the outsider left. So mm -hmm. strange definitions, but um, those those movements are the whitest and most middle class movements in American political life, including compared to the reactionary white, right. Mm -hmm. um, which is also pretty white, but it's not, it's actually the progressive and outsider left is whiter. Um, so the DSAs had this weird kind of paradox where because of its internal political quotas, all this leadership looks uh, female and brown, but its membership was like was like 80% men in most chapters. Mm -hmm. um, normally, uh, normally, let's say from what anecdotally, I'm not seeing the proof of this because this would be hard to find out, but it's mostly like uh, men who are downwardly mobile just out of college. Um, so what you're saying is that the um, the social democratic left, such as it is, won't be able to reach the diversity of the working class, the, no. the, a, a diverse working class, well, um, based on at least based on what its uh, its foundation is, based on what's who, the people who are most. If it's true that a bunch of you know middle class white guys aren't going to be able to organize, uh, you know, black workers very well, then that's going to be a hindrance. I'm not even I'm not even sure that the, the diversity itself is the issue. What it tells you is it's not actually penetrating in a broad section of the working class. If it was, 
it would reflect the demographics of that class, which are right. all over the place. I mean, it would right. still be majority white because that's the, that is the country that we live in. Despite, yeah, but like maybe sixty percent. Yeah, it'd white. be closer to like sixty, maybe seventy at most, depending on the area. Um, and the other thing is these these quotas and stuff are the same in most chapters, no matter where they're at, including places like, well, you live Portland or where I live, Salt Lake, mm -hmm. where th the population here is um, slightly white. I think it's around 65 percent white. And where you live, it's like 82, 83 percent white. So it's mm -hmm. like those quotas do not make sense that they would be the same. But that's not even not really the the issue that I that really bugs me about it. It's also where it's concentrated. Mm -hmm. So the DSA is largely concentrated in about four geographical regions. Uh, uh, the area around New York and New York and New Jersey is the biggest concentration from what I can tell. Mm -hmm. um, then you have California and the two cities. So uh, Southern California, LA, Northern California, the Bay Area. Um, then you have like the Portland to Seattle corridor. Mm -hmm. And there are individual city chapters that are quite influential um, all over the country, but they have nothing to hook up with at all. All right. And that is important to realize. Like mm -hmm. the DSA only has an electoral machine apparatus of any size and capacity in New York, um, where it does have like a congressional caucus and some other things. Um, but they're in areas where you could, as I used to talk to you on Pop Left, you could run a shoe with a D on it and it would win. Mm -hmm. Like, um, well, I mean, if we, if we think outside of the um, box of trying to uh, have immediate electoral wins, certainly uh, on the federal level, but even uh, maybe in the state level, and think of this as a, as a way to uh, the DSA, because I know the people at Cosmonaut want to use the DSA as a, a way to create a unified Marxist socialist party eventually they're going to struggle for into to make the dsa independent of the democrats are going to try to bring they have uh, the same problem within the dsa as the dsa has with the democrats their numbers are not sufficient enough to mm -hmm. to pull them away from a funding apparatus that is much larger mm -hmm. it is it is literally the same venture that the dsa itself was trying with the democrats with the with the squad strategy and that has utterly failed um mm -hmm. the reason why it's utterly failed is kind of simple game theory mm -hmm. donors have money donors are aligned with the dmc the dsa can usually give block grants to a candidate about five to seven thousand dollars now i don't know if people know how much it costs to run something but that's nothing um and most of the dsa's money goes back into running the dsa um it mm -hmm. is not it's not ran um particularly poorly it's not ran particularly corruptly that's not that's not what i'm implying by that but that's what most of those dues go for it's not actually when you look at yes it can, can it can command millions of dollars but when you look at an organization that has a hundred thousand people in it and both local and and uh national dues you would expect that its command of money would actually be greater than it is, it, it, but its dues are low. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign has always been larger than the DSA. And the, But my point about this, and this is what people should be concerned with, the DSA is rapidly declining. What I started my article off with is this news from about from April that while only two... 2,000 members have been formally lost, which is the first negative growth the DSA has really seen. Um, 25,000 have expired, meaning that they've lost a fourth of their paying membership from expiration um, at the beginning of this year. So they exploded during COVID, like a, like a lot of unions, act, like my union did, for example, mm -hmm. exploded beginning of COVID, and then hemorrhaged off to lower than where it started uh, two years in, right? Because it couldn't figure out what to do around it. Well, this is true for the DSA too. Um, interestingly enough, though, if we look at the growth patterns of the DSA, the DSA grows off of a Bernie failure. It'll During a Bernie campaign, its growth will pause. And then as soon as Bernie loses, it'll explode. And that's happened twice, hmm. all right? Um, so... 
there is a systemic reason other than Bernie's success are the workers' movement. And I don't think that this is cynical. Mm-hmm. All right. This is a feedback loop that gives you a kind of a bad lesson where we know the DSA grows and it makes our organization bigger when Bernie runs and fails. So it sounds like this Adolf Reed story, which I've never really believed. That well, neither they, does he anymore. Right. I know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know. But the, the, the Adolf Reed story that we're, we're running Bernie to build the workers movement. What's, and then we see growth in the DSA and the DSA. One thing I will say the DSA in these areas that have, large dsa penetration new york there is working class members of the dsa that's Mm -hmm. you know um it's harder to speak to these like what the membership is in in specific geographical areas because the dsa doesn't hide its numbers but it doesn't really sort them for you Mm -hmm. um but let's look at where we are though for the national level campaign because i think one of the ironies of this is uh, Mercedic talks about how toxic the environment is for Democrats. And this is the first time in a long time where Democrats poll is massively more unpopular than an unpopular president and more unpopular than the Republicans. The Republican Congress has been lar- largely unpopular for 30 years, whenever mm-hmm. they've been in power. Uh, the Democratic Congress is more unpopular. It is hemorrhaging people who are younger um, mm-hmm. And it didn't have a lot of penetration with older people. It The idea that it was going to survive off of demographic growth in its direction never made a lot of sense. Um, the only voting bloc that's been reliably democratic in every, in every um, election has been black women uh with with degrees that's like that that's a solid voting block that doesn't deviate but everybody else has deviated at different times and places and it makes sense Mm -hmm. like um asian americans particularly south asians um have usually voted um republican until 2006 and then Mm -hmm. that's been reverting back uh during the trump administration back to pre-2006 norms Mm -hmm. um uh, Latino voters have been all over the place and it really go, goes down to the sub demographic. And you want to know what it's actually class demographics are more predictive, although even though they're not that predictive, um, are more predictive than racial demographics. But Democrats have never wanted to look at that. And then there's this phenomenon that Pascal Robert has been talking a lot about, about how a lot of black men are reacting to particularly the gender wars issues um and increasingly either siding with the republicans or just stepping out like mm-hmm. um, well I, I wanted to get to a question about the, the the because in your answers here you've been really focused on you know how people you know in a sense how people vote i mean in and and how their political ideology lines up with the parties that we that exist even if that one of those parties is the dsa which isn't really an electoral party at all but uh, and your your the conclusion of your essay um, mentions how the Republicans have been having success running at the local level, even in blue states, even where you wouldn't expect them to uh, lately. And that maybe shows a, a potential strategy for socialists to use that we could we could run socialist candidates on the local level and build from the ground up. And but but it seems to me that the when you run Republicans in blue states and you have local level success that you're building something that can then reach out to the larger Republican party and, and build a base for uh, power to be developed on a larger level, you know, either uh, uh, on the state level or our federal level because of these local successes, you're infiltrating blue states with, with the backing of a, of a national party. And if you have a so- socialist groups running local candidates, the, the likelihood would be that you'd have localized socialist parties running local candidates in areas that then would be isolated and wouldn't have a path forward. You'd need a national party to develop as well, I think, in order to to have a good strategy for expanding the realm of power rather than just having isolated politicians who can't get very much done on the local level even. What would you think 
what do you think? Am I misguided there? I, I think I think a lot of you Gen X horizonalists are so burnt by horizonalism that you you forget you live in a federated republic. Okay. By that I mean you will never build a national party starting at the national level. It will not happen. Um, the reason why is to make sure it, can, it is not a viable strategy after 1992 and 1996 when the Reform Party actually can command significant parts of a vote. State level laws were changed in which entering most states system as an independent party from the outside is almost impossible to do. You'd have to build your base up coordinatedly at a national level, but not with a national party till you took enough states to build one. And that's, I mean, that was, that led to the fiasco of, uh, um, of the the whole Bernie strategy in the first place, because into the Ackerman plan and the Ackerman concession and all this stuff floated by the DSA. And there's two problems with it. And I mean, the, the elephant in the room we haven't talked about is, yeah, I've talked about the workers and vague, and vague strikes, but let's talk about them directly right now. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what party is most aligned with the workers, but what we can say for sure is that after 2020, the Democrats are, are less so. And we only know that, and again, we have to do with the stats that we have. Less than they were in the past. You don't less mean less than they than were in the past, right. Mm. Um, because the aggregate wealth of a Democrat actually got higher than the aggregate wealth of a Republican for the first time that, since we've been keeping the stats. And that happened in 2020. Now it's a small increase. When people say, oh, that means the GOP is now a workers' party, it, it doesn't like that's not what that indicates, but what it does tell you, and then the Newsom recall makes this even clearer, is mm -hmm. that Democrats now rely largely on a graduate school educated electoral base. Given everything that we see and the trends in the economy that are going to increase in this recession that's coming up, um, the workers, qua the workers, are going to be less educated. All right. Because who's getting degrees to get shit jobs anymore when you just get the shit job? Um, and so this penetration of a little bit of the college educated people into the working class, uh, which was always like a small group anyway, um, is going to decline. The Democrats have no other strategy. They, they've failed with this um, identity strategy. And you can see it in their rhetoric. You will notice that the quote what rhetoric is still with us at the activist level that the national level you hear it less and less and less mm -hmm. i mean yesterday was juneteenth i didn't hear shit mm. like um and i think that's because everyone's realized that that, that idea that that alone was going to keep a minority voter base and that's in quotation marks um loyal to the democrats isn't true that the future of the party, the aggregate future of the party is in the Kamala Harris is kind of the aggregate Democratic voter. Well, if your aggregate Democratic voter is well off college educated black women, mm -hmm. that's like that's one, not enough. <laughs> that's one fifth of of twelve percent of the population. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. but just that, a, one last comment, and then I got I got uh, I want to run a clip from Boschkar. Uh, I ran an interview with Boschkar last week. Um, but overall, you feel as though the strategy of running Bernie Sanders again is a failed one. And, and despite whatever kind of, uh, uh, you know, illusions we might have or little, you know, moments that appear to indicate that there's been some progress made due to the Bernie Sanders campaign, you, you're skeptical of that. You feel that those things are most, mostly illusory and that, um, that we, we need to take a different tact. I, I would I would say I don't think they were illusory after 2016. Mm -hmm. I actually do think they were illusory after 2020 because the the movement of you know of socialism, what it really ended up doing, if we're completely honest, was to bring a few working class people who've been completely demodalized out, but mostly to rebrand the same people that we used to call progressives as 
democratic socialist with very little changes in policy and very little changes in demographic. All right. Well, hey, thanks for uh, coming on the magazine show. And I hope that you continue to write for the magazine so I can have an excuse to talk to you again. All right. All right. All right, Ashley, um, I'm going to run a clip from the Boschkar uh, interview now because I feel like that's a good follow up to what the conversation I just had with Derek. And maybe I'll run the clip from the Social Justice Incorporated show uh, next week. Um, I do want to point out that we do have a new podcast called Social Justice Incorporated. Freddie DeBoer was the first guest on the show and it was um, it did well. It's got lots of views so far and um, it's worth watching. So if you haven't seen it yet, people should go. Uh, look at that later. Um, but for now, I'll go over to uh, this Boschkar interview and we can just sort of comment on that if we have anything to say about it afterwards. Here we go. Adolf Reed was recently interviewed on This is Revolution, uh, which is a podcast that you know that I know Jason and Pascal. Um, and he admitted... Um, that while he had supported the Sanders campaign with the hope of building a kind of long-term movement out of it uh, that, that would last, to create kind of new institutions for class-based struggle out of that, that movement, that, in fact, that was not the result of the Sanders campaign, that no new institutions or movements arose. So what do you think accounts from, for this failure of the Sanders campaign in the way that Adolf Reed described it? That, that doesn't create, it didn't create a new movement. Um, yeah, I think part of it was failings of Sanders himself of not prioritizing that and also not being that kind of leader. Like he wasn't, but also the question is, who was he going to lead? In other words, he had built a base because it was a, like a left populist campaign, builds a base of voters, of people who like this individual figure and like his class struggle messaging. That's who he built. But did he really build a base of activists that had any sort of leverage or points in which they can organize? So in other words, what would have this, let's say Sanders tried to build a mass movement, he attracted, let's say, the activists 1% of his, um, of his broad voting bloc. Uh, would it look very different than what DSA is now? In other words, like a motley collection of people recruited in ones and twos, uh, far more um, identity focused than most Americans far more college educated, far more just fringe and 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 prone to splitting, you know, than 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 the base would it actually have had this mass um, um, root. Like where where was the um, big trade union that had a billion you know militants ready to fight for Sanders and ready to um, you know um, help implement his program? It wasn't that kind of thing. It was a fleeting um, attempt that really only would have worked because it was this left populist attempt, only would have worked with state power, only would have worked with um, like maybe a general election run even. Uh, a longer period of time and the ability to use a greater bully pulpit to direct people to mass action to kind of unblock the state. So there we can see, you know, uh, that's almost Boschkar, uh rejoinder to Derek, uh, you know, saying like, you know, we we were at least at the time uh, kind of throwing a Hail Mary pass uh, to uh, accruing enough power to uh, unblock um, the, the workers movement and give them enough uh, power to start again after being hollowed out on the level of unions in the in civil, civil society. Um, I didn't find it a, a particularly convincing argument at the time, uh, but it, it at least made it made some sense as to what they were attempting to do. I want to address um, a comment uh, that's come up as we've gone along here. Someone says, why aren't we informing people about failing food crops across the planet and the urgency of learning and sharing knowledge on skills and logistical effort to survive these changes? And that comes on the heel of a comment from the same person, I believe. Is this what most U.S. leftists will talk about for the next two years? 
This is depressing. Electoralism is dead. Why aren't we informing people about food crops? And, and I'll just say that we can't give up on some kind of politics. It doesn't have to be electoral politics necessarily. Um, but, you know, I, I started out in 2009 podcasting uh, after the economic crisis. And at that moment, there was a big push on the left, especially in the Pacific Northwest, to help people create kitchen gardens and, or, you know, which, you know, backyard uh, chickens became big, uh, you know, self-sufficiency uh, was all the rage. Um, and I explored that at the time and, and actually wrote a book called Pick Your Battle, where uh, I came to the conclusion that that was actually um, just a, a leisure activity amongst the middle class and was not actually, actually any kind of political project that could uh, hope to um, create a new kind of society. Um, and that's my stance now is that while I'm all for people creating kitchen gardens and learning how to live off the land, that we have populations on the, on the level where we're going to have to have food distribution and agriculture to survive. And we're going to have to have functioning societies to, to deal with that. So that would be my, my answer to that question. Ashley, what, go ahead. I'm not sure that that's, um, I'll, although I completely agree with you, I think he's trying to say like, we are talking about this, we're sort of beating a dead horse instead of thinking about the real threats that are facing us. I don't think he was saying that the answer to that was to like rescale in this kind of like um, 1960s, 1970s kind of critique of descaling mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. I think it's more um, maybe becoming more aware that the end is nigh in a way that we perhaps don't sufficiently appreciate. I know I interviewed Ted Reese recently. And I think that um, episode will come out in a couple of days for a book mm -hmm. that we solicited, I solicited at least at, at zero mm -hmm. when we were still at zero um, mm -hmm. about Henrik Grossman. And he's very much within that camp that you know, really, really serious problems are are arising. And they're not just like natural problems of just the limits of the planet. They are the problems of of that are produced by capital, capitalism. And the fact that we don't exist in a direct relationship with, for example, food production. And we are coming to a point where it, it may be, um, I don't want to put words into his mouth. I'm not sure he would exactly say this, but it is more more profitable not to produce and to destroy than to produce uh and that's kind of maybe where the conversation needs to be i know for like the thing that has always galvanized me um is not catastrophizing but an awareness that catastrophe is looming but is so unnecessary and that actually the world could be so much better because if you you come at people all the time like the world is ending. The world is ending. You know, they get, they're just like, just leave me alone. You know, <laughs> just leave me alone with my chickens. <laughs> I just want to get on with my life. Um, they get this kind of um, exhaustion because every time you open a newspaper, all of these different single issue campaigns, these lobby groups and organizations are competing for your attention. And they're all saying the same thing. The world is ending. This is the biggest problem facing us. All men are rapists. And like, they, you know, they'll make this really, really, they make these really big claims and we're all sort of like, yeah. Uh, and so it, it falls on deaf ears. And I think you have to balance catastrophizing just to respond to that comment. You have to balance an awareness of this horror that's approaching with the complete un lack of necessity of it. It's not a natural thing. Um, and that we as human beings, we can actually deal with these problems. But at the moment, we can't. We can't. We're not dealing. We're not able to act on the world in a direct way. We always act on the world through the medium of profit. Um, if it is profitable, it will happen. If it's not, it won't. Um, and what we're trying to overcome is that division, is that separation of human beings from our ends and our goals. Um, and we can do that and the world will be better. And it's not about taking things away and living with less and living within your means to avoid catastrophe. It's about realizing the potentials of human creativity. We don't really believe in that anymore, but it is possible. Uh, I, I agree it's possible. And I try to believe, I'm, I try to be a believer. Um, do you have any thoughts on the, way this uh, second episode of the Sublation Magazine show came together and the, the themes that arose. I mean, we started with the uh, an article about the progressive left uh, hollowing itself out. Then mm -hmm. we looked at the, the social democratic wing of the, of the left um, that, you know, 
tried to set itself apart from the neoliberal progressive left uh, and its failures. And and now we are ending on uh, on a note of just hoping to to find some way to believe in our collective agency again. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, look, I think I honestly think that um, American electoral politics is had, uh, held up as like, well, this is our only hope. I and I, I I get that we can't give up on politics, but I mean a party that is overrun by managers whose main desire is to manage the subjectivity and behavior of the working class is always going to be a dead end. That's what <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's what it's become. And that's what it's become in the UK as well until we can find a way to get beyond that and to have a, and to not fear mass movements of working class people. We were, we we're going to be stuck here for a long time and there are dire consequences for that. Okay. Well then, I think that that's a good place to end the the, for, uh, the second episode of Sublation Magazine show. People who um, have are watching can watch the second hour. Will be in about ten minutes. Will be even more freeform than the first hour. Uh, it's just for patrons only. You can go over to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash diet soap um, and uh, find a link to the live stream there. Um, I'm going to end with our opening credits again. And uh, Wait, can I just say just a little mm -hmm. teaser? I had this whole thing that I wanted to talk about as this um, all of these uh, obsession with identity is becoming like a religion. I was going to riff off Marx and China and the tables oh. beginning to oh, dance. Oh, do you want to do that in the second hour? <laughs> oh, so stay tuned in the second hour. OK. All right. All right. OK. We look forward to that. In the case of nuclear or radiological fallout, people living around potential targets such as military bases and chemical plants may be advised to evacuate.